So my job today is, I, I, I work mainly in lupus, but I run a connective tissue disease clinic. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about biologics, biosimilars, and I'm going to use some um, examples from lupus which are generalizable to other conditions when we think about personalized medicine and the future of precision health um, for patients. Um, so this is the hospital I work in. This is Manchester University Hospitals Trust, a new PFI build linked to the University of Manchester. And we call our center the Kelgren Center for Rheumatology after the first rheumatology professor in the UK, Jonas Kelgren, um, who was in our department in the 1950s. So I'm going to talk to you about personalized medicine today. And part of the reason that I'm going to start with an overview of connective tissue disease is just to give you a, a sense of where these things all fit together. And so although I say I'm, I've, I'm my expertise is in lupus, I treat patients with systemic sclerosis, inflammatory myopathies, etc., all within my connective tissue clinic. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, introduce you to biologics and biosimilars, and some of the, the nomenclature around this and the thinking around this. I'm going to talk to you then from an illustration point of view about the successes and failures of biologics in lupus to give you an idea of why we need to do better, and then talk about and point the way towards more personalized approaches, which will loop back to the original part of the talk. So um, my sticky button has been sticky again. Um, so whenever you think about connective tissue diseases, obviously this is Scleroderma UK, Scleroderma Reynolds UK, um, but a number of you may have other conditions. Another of you, uh, some of you may have myositis, lupus, um, Sjogren's syndrome, maybe some of you have antiphospholipid syndrome, etc. And some of you may have been told you've got an overlap condition. And it's interesting because lots of patients get very frustrated by this kind of um, naming of diseases and they think, well, can they not make up their mind what I've actually got? And uh, my wife says to me that next to psychiatrists, rheumatologists are the most indecisive diagnosticians because um, they seem to change their mind all the time as to what you've got. And I'm gonna tell you partly scientifically why that is. So first of all, connective tissue diseases do not just appear out of the blue. You're born with a genetic susceptibility to developing something. And the problem is we don't know what you're going to develop. Then the environment kicks in. Some of the early life influences begin to modify your immune status. And we actually know that some people develop antibodies long before they get any clinical manifestations. And then they sometimes get non-specific features. So if you think about Reno's phenomenon, 5% of the population of Reno's phenomenon, perhaps a GP might see a, a new scleroderma once in their entire career as a GP. That's the rarity of the condition. So it's looking for a needle in a haystack. And with fatigue and aches and pains, these are all very non-specific features and are often explained by more common things. And then it takes a while until people manifest with the full-blown condition. Now, of course, there's a huge effort now to try and find people earlier. But obviously, the things that push you towards being autoimmune and having an autoimmune condition, and then push you towards perhaps inflammation or vasospasm or fibrosis will come in different flavors for everybody. So as Chris said earlier, every systemic sclerosis patient is different. Every connective tissue disease patient is different. So I sort of think of this as sitting on a shifting sand. And there are people who clearly have lupus or Sjogren's or limited or diffuse systemic sclerosis, but there's lots of people in the middle who may have been called undifferentiated connective tissue disease. That doesn't mean we can't make up our mind what you've got. It just means we're not quite sure what's going to happen. Some of you have been described as having mixed connective tissue, or perhaps you've got lupus and Sjogren's or lupus and demand myositis. But these conditions hunt in packs, as I tell my medical students. So therefore, if you've got one, you might actually develop features of the other, and you shouldn't be shocked to see people with overlapping syndromes. The autoantibodies as well, some people have very, very specific disease, so may just have a single autoantibody linked to a single phenotype, but we see people with lupus who might have a centromere, or might have an RNP, or might have a JO1 as well. So therefore, then you begin to think, well, what's going to happen to them in the future? Or is it just that they've got an autoantibody and they're never going to develop the clinical correlate of that antibody? So that's why 
this area of medicine is so interesting because there's a lot of overlap and a lot of moving between conditions. And take the condition that your society has as part of its name, Raynaud's phenomenon. Essentially, with systemic sclerosis, everybody pretty much will have Raynaud's phenomenon. If you go to a lupus clinic, about 50% of our patients will have Raynaud's. Some people with myositis, Sjogren's, will also have Raynaud's phenomenon. If you look at the other features of these conditions, lupus is a very intensely inflammatory disease, as is myositis. We know that there is some inflammation underlying many of the aspects of systemic sclerosis, particularly early. But actually, the sort of the feature of fibrosis and, uh, and vasospasm is very much systemic sclerosis. But we see scarring in lupus. We see a lot of scarring in our myositis patients, etc. So the processes underlying these conditions vary. And so the clinical manifestations will vary. So what about treatment? Now, you've heard a lot today about a, a range of different treatments that are used for systemic sclerosis. You'll hear a lot more later on this afternoon. So I'm going to just go to step back a little bit as to thinking about the types of treatments that we use to treat patients and talk about biologics and biosimilars. So let's take a non-biological drug. Can we move the slide on, please? Okay, so here's Adelat. Adelat is nifedipine. If you look down a microscope, this is the biochemical structure that was patent, patented as nifedipine or Adelat. Okay, so once the patent runs out, everybody knows the biochemical structure of this. So all they have to do is to make a generic drug that has got the same active ingredient, and you're probably, some of you are probably on other named products, and if the slide moves forward, we'll be able to tell you what those are, but it might be nifedipress, it might be tensipine, it might be generic nifedipine. But if you look down the microscope, it's exactly the same molecule. The simple biochemical structure is the same. So you might go to your GP and he might prescribe nifedipine generically, and today you get a purple tablet, and next month you get a red tablet, but it's still nifedipine. It's still the active ingredient. It works exactly the same and it's the biochemical structure that's completely identical. So once a drug comes off patent, other companies make it generic using the same molecule. Biologics are made differently. They're made by a biological process. So often they're made by introducing a vector into a, a bacteria or into a living system, and then the, the molecule is developed um, and expressed through that. So a biological therapy is a substance that is made from a living organism or its products. Biological drugs include things like vaccines, um, the, the, the targeted proteins we use in rheumatology, etc. And these are very, very complicated molecules. And they're mixtures of protein, sugar, carbohydrates, etc. And so the combination and the complexity of the growing conditions make these very, very complicated molecules. So this is rituximab, okay? Now rituximab is a very expensive drug to make because of the manufacturing process, the purity, the, the, the conditions it has to be made in and stuff. But this is just like the skeleton of the molecule. And look how complicated it is compared to, let's say, um, nifedipine. These are proteins wrapped around each other. There's lots of little sugars and carbohydrates all over this molecule. And it turns out that every time you manufacture a batch of rituximab, even the patented molecule originally, Mabthera, it isn't absolutely 100% the same as the previous one. So this would be like you growing tomatoes in your greenhouse. You know, today you grow tomatoes, next year you grow tomatoes. They're still tomatoes, but there's just slight variation because this year you had a bad summer or the soil was a bit different or whatever, but they're still the same tomato from the same seed. They look different, they taste fine, and you'll still put them on your salads, okay? So rituximab, essentially, there's a slight drift every time you make it, but the active, are, the active piece of the molecule still does exactly what it's meant to do, and it works every time. Biosimilars, then what happens is a company cannot make the identical original rituximab molecule or tocilizumab molecule or anything anymore. 
So what the biosimilar companies do is they develop a very similar manufacturing process. And so at an active level, the molecule is doing exactly the same. But if you drill down into the sugars and the carbohydrates and the proteins, there's very slight variation. But the active part of the molecule does exactly what the originator does. And these are what are known as biosimilars. Now, if you do clinical trials of biosimilars, you have to prove all those points. So you have to prove that in the case of rituximab, which is a B cell depleting drug, that your biosimilar depletes B cells to the same extent within a very small margin of error. You then have to take a condition for which the originator has been licensed, such as rheumatoid arthritis, and say, well, actually, when we put it into people with rheumatoid arthritis, it does the same thing. They get the same reduction in their arthritis, the same improvement in their joint counts, etc. Now, if it turns out your biosimilar does way better, then it's not a similar. It's a new drug, and you have to go back to square one and do the whole licensing process again, because that's a new drug, because it's not similar. It's different. Okay? And if it's less good, then A, it's not going to get to market, but clearly it wasn't similar. So one person commented to me when we go to our international conferences that if you look at biosimilar posters, all the curves are sitting on top of each other, so they're really, really boring posters. These are really boring presentations, but they have to be boring because they have to show that it is similar to the originator, and then you can put that out into the marketplace. So one of my colleagues, Dr. Heyrich, tells me that if you think about somebody with a jumbo jet, if you can imagine dismantling a jumbo jet and putting it on the ground and saying, right, I want you to rebuild the jumbo jet, okay? With good engineering and good practice, you will be able to rebuild it. It will fly. It'll be safe, etc. But there might be a few little bits lying on the ground, and there might be little bits that are not quite the same. But the essential bits of the molecule and the safety of the molecule and the efficacy of the molecule will be the same and your aircraft will fly wherever you go. But there might be just a few little bits that are different, okay? And this is very, very rigorously regulated. So this isn't just a company telling you this. You have to demonstrate the clear evidence that this is happening. Otherwise, you cannot get the biosimilar into the marketplace. But virtually every um, drug company is working on this. And again, if we move forward, if you look at the originator molecules, and some of you might actually know people or may actually have had some of these treatments in the past. So etanercept was marketed as Embril, rituximab as Mabthera, infliximab as Remicade, adalumumab as Humira, and tocilizumab as Roactemera. Now, there is a host of these, and these are just some examples of the biosimilars that are now available. So things like Benapali, as a, as a biosimilar of etanocept. There's Truxima, Rixathon, and Reditux. Um, infliximab has Inflectra, Flexabe, Remsema. There's Siltezo, there's Exemtia, and these are beginning to sort of come in now in the UK. Tocilizumab is several in development as well. So there's a big, big push to develop biosimilars across the, the pharma. And it's not just, so basically you might find that a company who made an originator will also have a biosimilars arm that will make biosimilars of other companies' biologics because biologics and biosimilars remain very expensive molecules. Therefore, there's a big market and a, an enlarging market for these. So what are the drivers for using biosimilars in the, um, in the clinic? Well, first of all, these, the originators are very high cost. So if you look at adalumumab, adalumumab or Humira is one of the biggest grossing drugs in the UK and is one of the biggest drug costs to the NHS is adalumumab because it's an originator biologic and it's effective in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease and eye disease. So they have got thousands of patients on an extremely expensive drug. And rheumatologists, we used to be the bottom feeders in, in hospitals. We used warm wax and methotrexate, and we didn't cost anybody very much, and nobody even knew we existed. Now everybody is interested in us because we're spending millions and millions of pounds a year on treating patients with these effective biological drugs. So there's a big drive to contain costs. 
So one of the big container, one of the big drivers for biosimilars is that they tend to come in because their development window is shorter um, at about 20 to 40 percent less. Similar efficacy and safety, they also provoke revision of the originator costs. And we've seen this already, that some of the originators then begin to suddenly drop their costs when the biosimilars come in. So it provides competition in the marketplace. And competition is good from our point of view because it widens the numbers of patients that we can treat for the same budget and it provides additional savings to the NHS that can be used elsewhere. And I think there's some good evidence now that we're able to begin to start the argument of widening access because cheaper drugs become more cost effective. So some of the cost effectiveness bars improve and you can widen the number of patients who can get certain treatments. So what about successes and failures? Now, I'm, I'm going to step into lupus now um, just to give you an idea of some of the less successful clinical trials that have been happening, but as an illustration of where we need to move in the future. So this is licensed medications for rheumatoid arthritis. You can see this huge explosion since 2000 of new drugs that have come into the marketplace for rheumatoid arthritis, the vast majority of which are biologicals. Okay? And this list continues to grow year on year. In lupus, somebody pressed a pause button in 1958, and there's only been one drug licensed for one drug licensed for lupus in the past 60 years, and that was belumumab. Now that's not for want of trying, because if you look at the list of drugs, so, sorry, let me just go on one. If you look at the list of drugs that have been tested in lupus. This is probably more than 250 million pounds worth of investment from drug companies and drugs that have failed to reach a, an end point and therefore proceed any further um, in lupus uh, research. So what that means is we've got several licensed medications, but virtually everything else from the biological point of view and disease modifying point of view that we use both for lupus and other connective tissue diseases are unlicensed. So when we give patients azathioprine, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, or TAC, or even rituximab, there's no license that says we can use that in lupus. But we can't leave people on high dose steroids all the time, so we're using unlicensed medications. So we're left in that limbo where actually we're at the mercy of the payers and the, 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 the health service to say what we can and cannot use. And then once you start to use expensive drugs, then they say, hold on a minute, now you're using an expensive unlicensed drug, and they clamp down on us. And we spent our time with NHS England arguing the case for many of these expensive agents. So one of the drugs that has worked is belumumab, and belumumab targets a particular receptor on the B cell and down-regulates your B cells. And it works, so they've done several trials that have shown that belumumab is better than standard of care for the treatment of lupus, and they've done several further trials that have confirmed that. So they've done about four major clinical trials now that demonstrate benefit in active lupus over controls. If you look at rituximab, rituximab is a drug that we do use to some extent, but actually the, the original clinical trials of rituximab were, were negative. And this is getting slightly frustrating, sorry. Um, the, you can see here that actually, compared to standard of care, there really was no difference in this trial between rituximab's efficacy and the usual background therapy. So the people who didn't get rituximab did just as well. Or if you say a 30% response rate, they did just as badly. But we know it works because, so this is an objective measure of protein in the kidney from people with lupus nephritis, lupus in the kidney. And you can't make, this is not that the patient said they felt better, it's a measurable improvement in proteinuria in people who had very active kidney disease. And you can see very dramatic reductions in the amount of protein um, from the kidney. And we've also put together a national register um, of lupus patients going on to rituximab, and we found that about 50% respond at six months, very early, but a very demonstrable response. About five or six percent further get no further flare, so over, just over half have a response, and about 20% had an excellent response such that they were even getting down their steroids and doing extremely well within six months of getting um, rituximab. 
So that's led to a lot of politicking, and Chris has alluded to this earlier. What happens when you have an unlicensed or an unproven drug, or what happens when you've got an expensive drug that shows some benefit, is that NICE get involved, NHS England get involved, and their initial impression is, we don't want to fund this unless you can prove absolutely very solid cost effectiveness. But we've been successful, and the lupus community and the connective tissue disease community have worked very, very hard through rheumatology and lobbying from the BSR, etc., to get some access to these products for patients. Because ultimately, we know there are subsets and groups of patients that should have access to these drugs. So we've now got an NHS England policy for rituximab, which is, I think is unique as one of the few NHS England policies for an unlicensed biologic in rheumatology. And we've also got an NHS England and NICE approval for, um, for belumumab. But it comes with, and I'm not going to go through all this with you, but it comes with lots of criteria that the patient has to fulfill. And if you go to the lupus one for belumumab, there's lots of criteria that you have to fulfill. And then there's lots of political things that one has to fulfill as well to get the drug. So these are managed access agreements. Everybody has to be registered. Everybody has to be followed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this isn't just your doctor saying, I think you would do well with this drug. I'm going to start you on it. It's a highly regulated process now. And you saw from Chris's talk earlier, it's the same with Byzantan. It's the same with Sildenafil, the non-biological drugs. But for biologicals and biosimilars, it remains a very highly regulated process. And so one of the things we did, along with the UK community and Lupus UK, was set up a national register that's been funded to track patients over time so that we can demonstrate in the real world what's happening to patients and the efficacy of these drugs. And that has actually been pivotal in allowing ongoing access to some of these biologics. So I think for uncommon diseases and for rare conditions and for conditions where we don't have a very strong evidence base, organizing ourselves into disease registers and tracking patients, being able to report outcomes over time, actually has a material benefit because it widens access to the drugs that we're trying to use. So it's basically an observation score. So if you had a half-term report on lupus, scleroderma, and any other um, connective tissue disease when it comes to biologics, I think we could say we could, we could do better. We really are doing well but there's much more that we should be able to do. So that comes to the thinking around personalized medicine. So one of, the, one of the hard facts about lupus, and I think a lot of other of the biological therapies and CTDs is, our best drugs work in about half the patients that get them, okay? So even with my best list, with the best will in the world, with everything I know about my lupus patient, let's say, if I give them belumumab, it's about a 50-50 chance that they're going to respond. So that's just about the same as tossing a coin. Okay? So we that's that's as good as we get. Okay? And that's not good enough because we would like to be able to say, well, actually, we don't want to commit you to something for six months that's not going to work. We would like to be able to channel you into things that are going to work. So this is what the thinking around precision medicine stratified medicine, personalized care is. You've got a bunch of patients who are coming for a treatment. And it is likely that some of them will respond better to certain treatments than others. But at the minute, we don't actually know how to stratify patients. But imagine if you had the ability to say, well, all the yellow patients will get cyclophosphamide, all the blue patients will get B cell depleters. Then you're into a much, much better place because you don't have to go through the frustration of two years of treatment that's not working on a trial and error basis. We put you straight on to something that's going to work straight away. Your outcomes will improve, and actually your trust in the medical profession will improve. improve. A lot of our lupus patients tell us that after three or four drugs not working, they begin to wonder what on earth is going on, and they begin to lose a little bit of faith in the system. And one of the ways they express that is they just don't take the drugs. And so therefore, they've got that frustration built in. And we're beginning to sort of get somewhere. So with belumumab, there are some markers. You don't have to worry what these are. But there are some factors that seem to suggest that belumumab works better in certain subsets of lupus patients. So it may not just be a one-size-fits-all drug. There might be a very specific population in which it works better. 
There's a drug that's in development for lupus at the minute. It's an anti-interferon drug called anafulamab. And they did show that there was some benefits of the drug over placebo. But they did this blood test at baseline, which was to measure how much interferon the patient was producing. And, and interestingly, those who produced the high interferon did way better with the drug than overall populations. And in those who had a low interferon, there really wasn't much different. So then that might mean in the future, if you were using a drug like this, you would do a baseline blood test and say, you're a high interferon producer, we'll give you this drug and it will work very well, or there's a much higher likelihood of it working. We've also done a systematic review in rituximab, and there's some clues in rituximab around things like the autoantibodies that people have, perhaps being a negative predictor of response, and some of the genetics that they have being a predictor of better response. So we need to refine that work as well. But getting back to that original star I showed you, this is another way to do it. These are all your connective tissue diseases, your undifferentiated patients. And one of the things I said to you earlier is that there are clearly shared features across these conditions, Raynaud's, the fibrosis, the inflammation, etc. And this is beginning to make people think that maybe if we think at a molecular level, then maybe not just thinking within the disease, but thinking across the disease might help us as well. Just to give you an example, these are genetic studies that have been done across a number of related autoimmune diseases. And the thing with the Venn diagram is, look at the amount of overlap. So there's a huge overlap in the genetic drivers of many of these conditions. And the genetics often upregulate certain inflammatory pathways or fibrotic pathways. So that makes you think that maybe if you stood back from just one disease and looked across conditions, you might get some clues as to what's important. And along with the Salford team, we've set up a study in Manchester called the LEAP study, which is the Lupus Extended Autoimmune Phenotype Study. And we've taken a pretty much an agnostic view of the connective tissues. And we've said, if you've got a connective tissue disease, no matter what your doctor has called it, you can come into this study. So whether you've been called lupus, UCTD, Sjogren's myositis scleroderma, or MCTD, everybody's welcome, okay? And we do, we, we're genotyping patients and we're looking at inflammatory proteins and subsets, etc. And so just to show you one uh, slide, this is going to be presented next week in the States. Essentially what we've got is a gene score looking at interferon activation in these patients. And the thing to show you is this is the line above which it's sort of said to be positive. But look, it's not confined to a single disease. If you look across these conditions, there's an interferon drive that cuts across many of these conditions, including some conditions where people haven't got quite full criteria for anything yet, etc. So it looks like there are some common pathways and common genes across these conditions. So in summary, therefore, when we think about connective tissue diseases, new treatments and particularly new biologics have been slow to develop but some do have evidence to support their use. But we do live in a very difficult health funding environment. Biosimilars provide competition in the marketplace and help to drive down costs when we can prove an effective treatment exists. And the observational registers like the BILAG register and others really help us to assess the real world effectiveness of these drugs. It also importantly helps support access to treatments because it demonstrates to government that we're playing this with a straight bat, if you like. And it helps to build the evidence base. So the future stratified medicine studies we're doing in Manchester at the moment are going to be based on the biologics register that we have. Most biological therapies, particularly in lupus, have about a 50% response rate. We also know that there's significant overlap across these connective tissue diseases in the types of inflammation and features that people have. So I think we need to better understand the subsets both within a condition, so you see the systemic sclerosis subsets and how that helps drive treatment and prognosis, but I think we also have to step back and think across the conditions as well, because I think we're going to get clues from looking that way as well. And as I say, the BRC in Manchester is doing work on this. So lots of people have helped with this work in Manchester, including Ariane's team over in Salford, 
um, the BILAG group, the UK rheumatologists and nephrologists, and the patients have really been involved in helping us develop this research program. So Simon has said earlier, I think he's gone now, um, but the patient involvement in this is really important to shape the agenda. And so I think it's important to stand back and think of the bigger picture, and to quote, uh, if I can get the last slide up, to quote the famous Irish band, The Water Boys, um, I saw the crescent and you saw the whole of the moon. Sometimes you see a little bit of things, but if you stand back, you can see something bigger. So thank you very much for inviting me down here today. Thank you.